Hello and welcome to Kitco Mining's Digging Deep with me, Paul Harris. Joining me this week is Nicole Adjad Bell of Kupal, advisory, a geologist, and a director of several juniors with extensive due diligence experience, accessing the technical, financial, fiscal, political, and ESG risks on precious and base metals projects. Nicole, welcome to Kitco. Thank you very much, Paul, for having me. I haven't seen you on Kitco since the conference last year, the PMS conference in Zurich. So nice to see you again. Well, absolutely. Very nice to see you too. Um, and a note for our viewers, please note that this conversation is not investment advice and that the opinions expressed are our own and not Kitco's. Um, Nicole, I'm going to start with copper. Copper hit a seven-month high, breaking through the four US dollars per pound again. A um, lot of news in copper, a lot of reasons for this. China smelters have agreed to curb production due to record low treatment and refining charges or TCRCs. Um, many juniors saw 5% or more gains this week. Uh, what's going on in the copper space? Why is the price moving now? I think that market participants are finally starting to realise that there is a very material looming structural shortage in primary copper supply that's coming. And as we know in our sector, uh, primary production is an inelastic response to demand pressures. And the only thing that makes the, uh, the, the supply side rise materially is investment, obviously, in new mines. And for that investment to occur, you need a much, much, much higher copper price. This is not a new thesis. We've been talking, well, I've been talking about this, probably boring everybody to tears because I've drunk the Kool-Aid on copper, is everybody agrees that there's a structural shortage. The price just hasn't had the response that we're starting to see now. And I think this is the very beginning of what I would say is a parabolic rise in copper price. We need that rise to incentivize new supply. Uh, copper is the critical commodity. Uh, without copy, copper, none of the, the green energy, net zero, et cetera, transition occurs. And so I am personally very, very favorably disposed towards copper as an investment thesis. Um, no disagreement with you there. I'm very much a copper bull tool too. Um, there's news that China's uh, just going to do another $139 billion of, uh, of, of investments uh, with a lot of that focused on renewable energy. Um, Renewable energy is very copper intensive, so demand is really set to grow. And, and I guess one of the key questions is, where is that extra supply going to come from? You touched on the fact that the copper price isn't at levels that in, are incentivizing new production. Um, research report came out this week that said uh, the capex of copper miners is at levels of about 50 billion a year, which is about approximately half of what it was a decade ago. So miners are not putting money into developing new projects. Actually, I think that's that's a positive thing. I think we're very good as a mining sector as a whole, not just on the copper side, of bringing in material new production when the market does not want it. So uh, I think that the CEO of Glencore has probably been the leader in the copper sector when he's made a statement that we are not bringing on new supply until the market is screaming for it. We've seen massive cost inflation over the sector. We've seen cost blowouts in big CapEx projects, whether it's direct new builds or whether it's expansion. And so at the moment, I would say, that the leaders of our industry, they're not getting incentivized to take on the risk to bring on new supply. And they will be more willing to take on that risk when the copper price is materially higher than what it is today. And personally, I think for big decisions to be made, investing billions of dollars into the ground, which is what we need, obviously, to incentive to bring on new primary supply, I think the copper price has to be above six bucks. So I've been saying that for a couple of years. So uh, broken clock is is is, uh, is right twice a day. At some point, I feel like it, it'll be heading upwards in that direction. And look, we've seen this in lithium. We've seen this in uranium. We've seen this in iron ore. We've seen this in gold previously is, is when underlying commodity prices rise, they tend to rise harder and faster than the market expects. And so if you want to be exposed to the equity exposure to those underlying commodity price movements, you have to be, you have to be already invested, willing to take obviously some downside risk. And I think we're at the very beginnings of what will be a parabolic rise in the copper price. I think you're right. And it's not just us that have that opinion. Robert uh, Mining Mogul, Robert Friedland uh, thinks prices will grow up to, I think, about seven and a half dollars uh, a pound, about $15,000 a ton. Uh, I want to touch on a couple of other copper-related news items this week. One was that Dundee Precious Metals is going to sell its Sumeb smelt in Namibia to uh, Chinese company Sino Mine. I think that surprised a lot of people because Sumeb has been a key part of Dundee's portfolio uh, for quite a number of years. I spoke with CEO David Ray this week and he said, look, this is no, no longer a key asset for us. We found other 
places to, to, to place our complex concentrate from our Chelepec operation in Bulgaria. So we no longer need this. We want to focus on our key nitty, our key business, which is building and operating mines. Um, other news, um, perhaps more closer to home for you, Nicole, Hot Chile and uh, is, continues to announce developments to its water strategy in Chile. Um, and it looks like the company could eventually become a water company with a, a sideline in copper. Uh, tell us about what's going on at Hot Chile. Sure. So I'm a non-exec chairman of Hot Chile. So obviously I have some biases towards my position on the company. Uh, I got involved in the company as, as a director at the beginning of 2022. And I uh, have benefited, I suppose, from the decisions that the management team made 10 years ago. And let's just talk about water for a second. As one of our Chilean employees says, and I love this saying, no project, no water. He also says no money, no honey. Uh, so water is the biggest risk that any mining company faces anywhere in the world today, and particularly in water poor regions like Chile. And the management team 10 years ago said water is exogenous risk. We do not believe that you'll be able to permit continental water extraction. So that's water extraction from the ground. They had a lot of foresight in making that assumption. And the reason that they made that decision 10 years ago is the timeline to get a water license. And in the case of Hot Chile, we have a marine concession for extraction of seawater. That process took eight years. Now, that's not because we're really bad at permitting. That's because how that's exactly how long it takes. It's very complex. You're dealing with an innumerable amount of stakeholders and regulatory bodies. And so we're the only uh, company within a basically 150 kilometer radius that made that decision. And I think we're benefiting from that now. And so one of the reasons why they move, we moved towards the team, moved towards a marine concession license is Hot Chili's project is amenable to seawater processing. And so it, in fact, it has slightly higher recoveries around 2%. And, and uh, the coastal projects share that commonality. It's the type of mineralogy of the deposit that means it's amenable to seawater of processing. So we do not have to build a desal plant. However, what we have is this license that took, that will take any of our peers 10 years to get. We also have the land to allow this, the connection into the seawater. That took an additional two years. You need naval uh, naval authority for that. And we have 2,000 litres per second currently under, under our existing licence. We need 600 litres per second as the, pro, as the project stands today. So what we have is an existing licence that can be expanded. And before you can start the permitting process for a desal plant, you need the marine concession and the land side of things as well. And so what we think we have is a strategic asset that unlocks enormous value for de development projects within a 152 200 kilometer radius. And if we look at the time value of money, obviously, if someone was to start the process that we started over a decade ago, that would be plus 10 years before they could even think about building their own project. And I think there's also movements going on, and it makes sense for uh, the Chilean government to say, okay, we don't want to see five desal plants and five sets of piping, et cetera, to, to facilitate the advancement of all of these projects. And I think there'll be a lot of encouragement for companies to start work, working together. And, and the reason why we started to focus on water after I joined the board was, I suppose, a very visceral realisation that we have this very strategic asset. And our job as a management team and board of a company where we have to uh, access markets to continue our business, when we're a non con, con cash flowing company with a very material development, copper development asset in low elevation Chile. And we went, well, we have this asset that we think has material value. And is there a way that we can start to extract value from that asset, uh, which is the water asset, to help fund our copper business? And that was really the, the basis for the announcement, the, the news release where we, we more clearly out, 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 outlined our water business strategy uh, going forward. And so there's been a lot of interest. And I think maybe some of our peer development companies are, are getting asked those sticky questions, which is, where is your water coming from? I think this is a, a very visionary thing. Um, great foresight, as you said. Uh, I believe the company is in the process of starting to talk with utilities about PPAs or, or similar agreements to, you know, where the utility comes and builds, manages and operates. Obviously, Hot Chili gets an offtake and potential to sell up the Wasco Valley. And up the Wasco Valley going east, there, I think the company says there's about six other copper projects, mines or developments, including the famous Vicuña district. So a potential water source for some of the, the Landine Group companies up there. 
Absolutely. And then the Wave Reunion, which is pretty proximal to us. So the Newmont Tech JV. And interestingly enough, I was at uh, probably one of the best mining conferences globally, the annual BMO conference that's held in Miami each year. And I sat in the presentations of Newmont and Barrick and, and Newmont CEO, Tom Palmer, as he's highlighting. Uh, that, uh, interestingly enough, the, the, the two largest gold companies in our sector are very focused on copper uh, and highlighted that their key six development projects in their their pipeline uh, and one of them was Nuevo Reunion. And so again, we unlock value for that in terms of being able to bring that forward in a more timely and efficient manner if uh, Tech and Newmont make a decision to more aggressively advance that project. Cool. Lots to watch out for there. Let's uh, turn to gold now, Nicole. Um, one of the interesting news items this week, Rupert Resources agreed to buy B2 Gold's 70% interest in the Helmy joint venture for $102.8 million. Canadian dollars. That Kelmy joint venture is in Finland and is directly to the west of Rupert's Ikari deposit. Um, consolidation there makes a lot of sense given that uh, Rupert pretty much needs the Helmy ground to allow the Ikari pit to lay back, uh, potentially a bigger pit there, plus the exploration uh, of the ground between Ikari and Helmy. What was your view of uh, what's happening there? Uh it's absolutely sensible consolidation. Uh, Rupert, led by James Withall, who I've known for a very long time, uh, exceptional geo, was on the buy side, and I, th I think has a very good understanding of capital markets and how to manage your business in this in this complex world where you need to access capital. Uh, they've done an, a fantastic job. Tier one discovery, I think it makes a huge amount of sense. B two probably is very busy at the moment with their recent Sabina acquisition and focused on that. So they're clearly messaging to the market we're willing to exit. How However, Orion does have a rofer on B2 selling uh, their share. And so it's not a done deal, I think. I think it will be tough for Orion to come up with the money unless it's a very creative financing strategy because their market cap is less than uh, the amount that's been offered by Rupert. But I think stepping back, we live in a world where there are just simply too many companies. We have over 3,000 listed juniors globally, uh, all competing for a finite source of capital. As we know, mining industry is pretty unloved. It's not considered sexy by most of the investors. And so we do need to see consolidation. And, and what you do, what you get with that is a reduction of corporate GNA per unit of essentially ground that you hold. And so I think it's a it's an interesting place to watch. Finland's a great place to do business. We we know there's operating mines there. Uh, it's a belt that has had probably very little attention. Other And it also, once you have consolidation and you can start looking at your geological package holistically, I think there's lots of opportunities that come from that. I think it's great. Well, you mentioned Orion Resources, or as some people say, Orion. Um, it certainly brings that into play. They hold the other 30% of the Helmy joint venture, which I guess now has a valuation of 44 million Canadian on it uh, due to the transaction that's underway with B2. Um, cleaning up the, uh, Helmy trans, the, the Helmy joint venture, could that be a, a prelude for a transaction on Rupert? I think it's worth noting that Agnico Eagle Mines owns 14.1% of Rupert. It also operates Kittler, which is the biggest gold mine in Finland, and it's uh, not too far away from, from Helmy and Nikari. Yeah, I would say that any larger mid-tier to major mining company would like to see juniors consolidate. They know that if they come in, they'll always have to pay more. So, uh, but having said that, uh, Agnico also has a history of being a willing seller when it takes large equity positions. And so just because Agnico has taken a large equity position in company X doesn't mean that it, that it necessarily will end up or want to end up owning that at the end of the day. So I think what this says is now you, if they're successful and Orion gets tied into the mix, then you have this very strategic belt of rocks with a tier one asset. There's very, very few tier, tier one assets in the world. Everybody says they have one. Uh, they're a bell curve. So most people don't. And so uh, as the majors are looking around then in the mid tiers, uh, this is this is an asset that has probably got the size and the quality and the life of mind that has to be on potential acquirers radar screens. It would seem to be that the, the next step of, uh, of what's happening here would be Rupert or somebody else trying to take out or Orion's 30%. Absolutely. Absolutely. And look, Dave Latan, one of the smartest guys I know, is chairman of the company. And so I think that you can that you can have trust that that he will manage that business uh, in a way that is to the benefit of all the stakeholders. 
Okay. I want to talk about a, an, another transaction in the gold space this week, and that is uh, Talisker Resources. They signed an all purchase agreement with New Gold, which will see it sell up to 350,000 tons of material mined from its Brilorni Gold project in British Columbia in Canada. That will be processed at New Gold's New Afton Mill. Um, this news release in and of itself may not be um, too spectacular, but I think uh, it's a good prelude to talking about what's going on in British Columbia. Uh, under this agreement, ore will be transported by truck more than 100 kilometers to the New Afton Mill uh, from the fully permitted Brulorni project. Uh, Brulorni holds a 1.63 million ounce resource at 6.3 grams per ton. But I think one of the uh, key things here, it uh, continues to talk of New Gold's resurgence. New Gold owns 11.1% of Talisker. It had uh, production of more than 400,000 ounces last year. It brought its all-in sustaining costs down to just over 1,500 US dollars per ounce. It issued its first ever three-year production guidance. It's now in a position to repay debt, build cash, and invest more in exploration. It seems New Gold is now starting to become a, a, a proper company, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, the note of caution I would say is that I can't think of a single example, and maybe one of the listeners of this can, of where a toll milling agreement has been positive for the supplier of the ore. Uh, normally, best case scenario, you're washing your face in terms of, and it takes a lot of management time, et cetera. Uh, it tends to be more positive for the purchaser of that, and in this case, that's New Gold. So I agree, uh, refreshing my view on New Gold just recently, that the company is doing what it needs to be doing. As an operating company, what you want to be is boring. And by that, I mean you want to have consistency. You don't want to have negative surprise. You want to do what you say you're going to do. Uh, it's a very thing, apparently, in our business to do. Uh, trust is the rarest commodity in the mining sector. And if companies simply stated their strategy clearly and then uh, then backfilled that strategy and under-promised and, and, and over-delivered, I think we'd see a lot more general positive reception about our sector as a whole. Stepping off that bandwagon and back to new gold, I agree. If someone's looking at gold and wanting to be exposed to gold, and their recent presentation does a very good job of highlighting this, it's got a very, very strong growth profile. So they prove that they've been focusing on the business, making it as uh, as robust as possible. They've got potential growth opportunities. However, I think there's an area of certainty around what will Ontario pe uh, teachers do with their uh, cash flow uh, exposure that they have the option to turn into a JV and they have 60 days. Uh, there was a four-year agreement and I believe they're going to have to come out with uh, an assessment on that at some point in the next uh, in the next two months. I would say if I was Ontario, I don't see the incentive for them to becoming, to becoming a JV partner rather reducing their ownership down so that they're exposed to free cash flow. Obviously, uh, as a you don't want to be fronting up, having to supply money as a JV partner. So I, I would bet probably that they'll 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 take the reduction in their ownership on, and keep the free cash because that's what I would do if I was them. So what does that mean? I think it needs to be tied into the view of what happens with the company going forward. But they're doing all the right things, and I think positioning themselves very well for this recent gold price rise that we've seen. And I, I would argue there's probably no reason as to why these strong gold prices are going to decline in the near future. And so when the world finally starts to wake up and the more generalist investors that you now have uh, operating companies that have got a massive amount of talk and exposure to true margin expansion. We've had a lot of inflation over the last couple of years. That's starting to taper off and in fact potentially go the other direction. And so maybe we'll be in this perfect storm of uh, controllable costs, predictable costs, and a rising gold price. I had the, the privilege to interview New Gold CEO Pat Godin at the BMO Metals Mining and Critical Minerals Conference in, uh, in Miami that you referred to earlier. Um, he had a big smile on his face. Um, he thinks the company's turned the corner around and he sees a very, very positive future there. And our viewers can see that on the Kitco Mining YouTube channel. Um, okay, now let's talk a little bit more about British Columbia because British Columbia seems to be the place to be now. Uh, Newmont certainly thinks so. It was a key driver of its acquisition of Newcrest. It really wants to build a, a critical mass, a tier one district in uh, in the Golden Triangle area. Also, we have Artemis Gold developing Blackwater, the former New Gold asset. Uh, that's due to have first production later this year. Up on the uh, on the starting line almost is Skeeners, SK Creek project. That's almost ready to go. Go and there's a lot more besides. Why has British Columbia suddenly become the place to be? 
Uh, partly it's geological endowment. Uh, there's obviously a number of commodity types and deposit types that are tier one in nature, Skeena being one of them, and Bruce Jack was probably one of the other ones that uh, that New Crest acquired uh, when they acquired Pretium. So you have these, you have an endowment, a very, very large endowment. You have Galore Creek, you have a lot of these copper gold porphyries uh, that's a, a result of the type of geology that is in BC. I think that the government... Despite being an NDP government, so more of a left-leaning government, has it has proven to not be a material hurdle towards being able to advance projects in a, in, a, in a sensible timeline. And what you're seeing with the larger companies at the moment is a very, very, very big focus on low-risk political d- jurisdictions. I mean, I would argue that every country in the world has risk. It just manifests itself in different ways. And in BC and in Canada and in Australia and in the States, that risk is around permitting and permitting t- timelines. And they're just getting longer and longer and longer and longer. So, uh, but once you have your asset up and running, you tend to not have the gold posts changed or the potential of of losing your asset or some of the things that we've seen happen, for instance, in Panama with Cobra Panama. So uh, it has the political risk, it ticks that box, it has geological endowment. Having said that, when you look at the copper gold porphyries in BC, they tend not to have a high grade starter pit. So, and they tend to be not that high grade. And so, again, if we see this rise in copper price that I think you and I agree is going to occur, it definitely makes a lot of these assets more valuable. And the other thing that BC has is very, very cheap power and green power. Most of the baseload electricity that is uh, that the province produces is hydro. And so, we're uniquely positioned from that perspective as well. And I live in Vancouver, so I get to benefit from low, <laughs> low power costs in, in our Department. Absolutely. The hydropower, the potential to have low carbon copper, that will uh, have significant market advantages, presumably, uh, particularly as we continue to advance in the energy transition and all things related there. Okay. Uh, while we're on energy transition, let's switch to lithium. Big news this morning. Lithium Americas announced that it's received a $2.26 billion loan from the U.S. Department of Energy to help develop the Thakapras project in Nevada. Last year, it raised $650 million from General Motors. Um, so it's pretty much all set to develop the, the project. Phase one construction cost is about $2.93 billion. What are your thoughts about this one, Nicole? I, uh, I'm of two minds. It, Lithium America's asset, Thakapras, is a clay asset. It's hectorite. Uh, there has not been a single, as far as I'm aware, hectorite clay lithium mine that's ever been put into production. And so in mining, you tend not to want to be a first mover in terms of new technology. So this is what this is. So there's risk around processing and risk around delivery of that timeline. I think what it says, interestingly enough, is for the government has materially put its money where its mouth is. There's been a lot of rhetoric globally, particularly in, in Western countries, that, that's focused on where are we that critical minerals that we need to have security of supply, we want to incentivise investment in critical minerals in our own countries. That's a very, very, very sizable bet being made by the government. However, having said that, uh, uh, I would like to see circling back to copper. I think they made that investment. They're clearly doing their DD on that investment when the lithium price was much, much higher than it is today. And in fact, when General Motors made their investment last year, that was in a much, much higher lithium price environment. The lithium price escalation that we saw over the last three years did what it should do. It brought material new investment into the sector. You saw a big increase in investment, obviously massive prices and price rises in the underlying equities that were exposed to lithium. And there's not a shortage of lithium in the world. So we, uh, this is an investment that's occurring as I would say the, the bubble is burst, burst a little bit on lithium. And so I really hope that this project, uh, that it doesn't have any capital blowouts, that the processing technology works because when you have governments investing into mining and it doesn't work well, it tends to be very, very negative for the mining sector as a whole rather than just for that specific asset. So it'll be a very fascinating one to follow. And look, the company's done an amazing job accessing capital, I would say, at, at a low cost. So it's, it's one to watch. Well, I think in addition to the execution risk, uh, Nicole, you, you touched on the fact that the lithium price has fallen quite considerably over the last year or so. Lithium is a, a relatively small market by volume, so new supply coming on stream can have a dramatic impact on supply and demand. It can flood the market um, and and destroy pricing. Um, 
Lithium Americas is planning for 40,000 tons per year of production eventually. Um, so it looks like perhaps once again, there's going to be a new mine coming to production. 20,000 tons or, or more is going to come in uh, each year. And um, the, the pricing may not be there to support that. And so the lithium price could fall further. Absolutely, absolutely. You're kind of biting the biting the hand that feeds you, and this is this is kind of what happens in each commodity all the time. You have a massive commodity price, money comes in, investment decisions are made, and then the commodity price turns, and then you tend to you can have a glut. And I agree with you. The problem with lithium, it's a small market. There is a lot of lithium in the world. We've seen a lot of investment into lithium asset, assets in both Australia and Chile, and obviously now the US. Uh, I would argue there's more. Uh, downside price risk in lithium than upside price risk. And so that means that the government may have potentially made a commitment to invest a material amount of money that is not going to have an economic return. Obviously, there's a strategic element to that investment decision as well. Okay. I want to quickly finish on silver. Um, the silver sector is trying to push silver as an energy uh, transition metal as well. Um, I don't want to talk about that, but what I want to focus on is silver crest metals. They reported their 2023 results this past week, net earnings of $116.7 million from its Las Chispas silver gold mine in Sonora in Mexico. The company ended the year with $86 million in cash, $20 million in bullion, and it repaid its $50 million term facility during the year. Um, Las Chispas does not have a long mine life, so uh, it suggests that uh, sooner or later the company is going to have to do a transaction. And there aren't that many primary silver deposits out there. There's a couple that do stand out for various reasons. Discovery Silver's Cordera in Chihuahua, which is looking to produce 33 million ounces a year of silver equivalent, and Vizsla Silver's Punuco in Sinaloa, uh, where it has a resource of 156 million ounces of silver equivalent. Well, what's your view of uh, silver, silver crest and what its future potentially holds. Uh, silver crystals again, and this is the, I feel like this is tier one discovery day. Uh, that again at tier one discovery, very, very rare. They've done a superb job on executing, and but like any asset in mining, it's a depleting asset. And there is a paucity of primary silver projects out there. So I think there's some creative things that can occur. The problem with Mexico, I think we've had a very big increase in political risk in terms of everybody's perception of political risk in Mexico. And so uh, as the company is looking around and, and Mexico is a very large silver producer, obviously, as, as is Peru. So I think that there is a thing that should occur, whether it will or not, I don't know, because there's always personalities at play, but it would make sense, for instance, First Majestic uh, to get together. Uh, so that makes a huge amount of sense. Whether or not it would happen is another question and consolidating assets within Mexico. Uh, also potentially going to the majors, uh, South 32 has Cunnington, which is one of the largest silver mines in the world. It's, it's not a core focus. You go and look at their presentation. They don't talk about it. They're very, very focused on Taylor, probably because they overpaid for it and now have to have to execute and justify its continued existence. But I think there may be some interesting transactions that it could occur with a silver company that should, in an idealized environment, trade potentially at some multiples to its nav, going and, and acquiring assets from larger companies that don't get that silver multiple. So silver is you know, gold on the steroids. Obviously, they're trying to, uh, silver companies are, are, are pushing the, the net zero element. Uh, gen, I, I think there will be there'll be a resurgence of interest into the sector. And But we know in our business, getting bigger because of the proliferation of ETFs, there is an argument now for m and to occur just to increase the size of your company and the increased buying interest that will occur because of that, because of the number of ETFs that are invested in this sector globally. I, th I think that's a rabbit hole to go down uh, at another moment in time, Nicole. <laughs> Sorry, I did go down that rabbit hole and then I had to stop myself. Stop, stop talking about it. No, it's a fascinating subject matter. I've written about it quite a lot recently. Um, so we'll get onto that. Um, but I think we're out of time today. So Nicole, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And we'll be seeing you again in a few weeks, hopefully. And this is Paul Harris digging deep for Kitco Mining. And if you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe.